So Dan, this is so exciting to actually have a series focused on what you can do in your home to, you know, well, I think two things, to lower the, your running costs and lower your CO2 output. But I mean, you know, out of all the people I've ever met, you are the one that knows this industry and this business the best. So it's fantastic that you're doing this. Well, that's, that's very kind. I've spent quite a lot of time in all the different areas, whether it's boilers, heat pumps, solar, energy storage, fuel cells, electric cars. I've spent time in all of those areas. So I'm really passionate, but heat is the thing I get really excited about yeah. because of the size of the contribution it can make to, to decarbonisation. So I'm genuinely excited because I think this is a subject that people are more and more interested in. They're, how can I actually lower the carbon emissions at, at my house? And actually it's quite a complicated subject. So when we've done episodes before, we might cover one technology at a time but actually you kind of need to talk about it as a whole you know how you insulate your property how you heat your property when and where you use your, your energy as well we're actually going to go and look at an array of different houses from uh, a tower block through to semi-detached properties to larger properties so hopefully by the end of this series everyone will be able to look and go actually I found a solution or a series of solutions for my house and now I can go and start that work so with this series, we started with talking about the house in general, right. uh, about insulation, about smart thermostats, about which energy tariff you're on, everything really from how you use it, when you use it, and some of the cheaper measures to begin with, just to get people in a position to say, actually, I can participate in this and I actually can lower my carbon footprint. We're going to do six episodes in, in total. We're going to start with insulation and, and fabric first and, and just using less energy. Then we're going to get into smart thermostats. We're going to talk to people about changing their uh, energy tariffs and obviously now there are different types of tariffs uh, that are more economic at different times of days and then we're going to get into some more familiar territory for fully charged we're going to talk about things like batteries like uh, solar pv solar thermal thermal storage and then as we go through the series we're going to get to the bit that i really find exciting uh, which is heat and hot water and we're going to look at some some new technologies as well as heat pumps so electric boilers, that's, I mean, I'm very excited about that because that's the last bit of my house that still burns stuff is, the, is our central heating boiler, which we don't use very often. But when we do, it just really grates with me and I just want to get rid of that. So there are alternatives to that now. Yeah, we're going to uh, some tower blocks in, in Sunderland to look at the Core 364 project with Sunamp. And actually, they've got multiple uh, tower blocks there and they've taken the gas boilers out of all of them. Wow. They've now got a, a huge ground source array beneath the tower block and in each, each of the blocks they've actually got uh, a shoebox heat pump uh, and they've also got a, a sun amp thermal uh, battery as well. So incredibly excited about that. That's a huge carbon reduction on, on a grand scale. And then in the last episode we get into technologies that are, are less well known but are kind of effectively zero emission boilers and, and that's where I think you, you'll be particularly excited. So heat's the big one. We're saving heat. For We're saving heat for last. You know, we, it is, it is, for me, it's, it's the most significant thing because I think most people will be looking at their boiler going, actually, maybe this is the last boiler I'll have. Yes. And it might have a year left. It might have five years left. It might have 10 years left. But they'll be thinking now, how do I get the next technology in to replace that? And I think that's quite complicated. But a, a home series that covers the, the wide gamut of what you can do in your home is really important. So I'm really looking forward to to see this. Well, I'm going to go and talk to an old energy efficiency expert pal of mine called uh, Tim Pollard and I'm going to talk to him about energy efficiency in general and, and insulation. I just can't let's get on with it. Get out there and film I can't, it. I, I can't wait to report back. Brilliant. Recent decades have taught us that the newest technologies are almost unstoppable. In the rush of progress away from fossil fuels towards sustainable technologies we mustn't forget the most important energy of all energy efficiency. The trouble is, humans are hugely wasteful. By the time the primary energy that's used at a coal-fired power station reaches your plug socket, 65% of it is lost. What's more, in the UK we have the leakiest housing stock in Europe, but it doesn't have to be that way.
We're going to talk to someone now who has been in this industry even longer than I have, energy efficiency expert Tim Pollard. Tim, fantastic to see you. I've known you for quite a long time. I know you know your stuff when it comes to decarbonising homes, but it can seem like quite a complicated topic. And I wonder if that's where part of the problem is. Shouldn't we make, be making this a bit easier for homeowners to say, I, I do want to move past my gas boiler. Where do I begin now? How do we get people on this journey? Well, as ever, it, it's understanding the principles, Dan. And the principle of, of any house is the cheapest energy that you're going to have is the energy you don't use. So if you can... Um, make your home as airtight as possible, then you're not going to lose heat. And actually, if you were to manage to get it very airtight, people would be the source of heat. You know, you and I wandering around. Some of us more than others. But perhaps so. <laughs> but so I would always say, if you're choosing stuff to do, it would be insulation before installation. Always, always, always. So... Very basic stuff, insulate your loft, your floor, your walls, wherever possible. Of course, some people live in homes without a cavity and that then starts to become more complicated. But most of us have cavities, fill it with something. You've got lots of different options. Glass wool and mineral wool are the ones that people are probably most familiar with. You know, that stuff that... Makes you feel like you've taken a bath full of ants, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you've got foam board, which is maybe a bit lighter and a, and, a, and a bit more handleable. And you've got entirely natural substances like sheep's wool, for example. Or people have used shredded newspaper in the past as, as, as a source. Whatever you can do to make your walls as efficient as possible and all the other gaps in your house as well your windows your doors then whatever heat source you're using and it's you know regardless of technology or fuel it's going to be more efficient but can you do some of this yourself or do you need to get an expert in uh, loft insulation that anyone can do it's dead simple there's no need for anyone other than you to do that just about everything else means it's some sort of involvement with the structure of a building and therefore you really need a professional. Because if you're drilling holes in walls or if you're tearing up floors, then you're probably going to need somebody to help you out to do that. So other than the loft, I'd say, yeah, I'm afraid you're probably going to need... But there's plenty of people out there. There's a really well-established industry who are, who are, you know, relatively competitive in terms of their market price. So I don't see that as a major barrier, I think, for most people. And to be honest, an awful lot of people have already done it. Yeah, there's a lot of lofts installed. There's a lot of walls that have been filled with, with, with whatever. Um, the problem is, of course, is that um, standards have changed over the years. So... What was effective lost loft insulation 20 years ago is not so effective now. So, but, you know, it's become more, it's become denser, it's become thicker, and the standards have changed. So even if you've had it done, it might be worth having a look and see how much you've got up there and, and laying another layer on top or, or in, indeed with your walls. When you start coming to solid wall, that is definitely, definitely a professional job either internal or external. Most people would go external if they can, because becoming internal means that you've got to lose some space. It's very intrusive. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to disturb the way you live and the way your family live, and it's quite expensive. So people would always go external if they can, but of course it will affect the look of your building. And in some areas where that's going to be sensitive, whether you have a listed building or whether it's going to be in a conservation area, that might prove to be difficult. So let's say we've insulated mm -hmm. and we've improved the, the envelope of the property. Mm -hmm. Then the next stage, because um, I'm interested in, in cheaper measures right yeah. through to the more expensive ones. And heating, sure. let's be honest, heating's probably going to be the big, the big one that people sure. move to over time if they're not ready to do it now, if they haven't got the funds to do it now. So after insulation, how we use our energy and energy efficiency, and I've heard you talk about this many, many times is interesting to me. And you don't necessarily need a smart meter to know you're wasting 
no. energy, but no. equally, is the EPC, the energy performance certificate that comes with a property in the UK, is that a, a, of any use or, or, or not? It's a useful guide. It's a useful guide. Um, I, I rather like the EPC. I, I think the, the issue with EPC has been in the past, um, it hasn't been delivered very well, <laughs> um, uh, particularly in the early days. And perhaps it needs to be um, up, upmoded, I think, because it's a bit old fashioned now. But it could become the currency of, of energy efficiency, if you like. And uh, of course, you need one if, you, if, you, if you're selling your home. So if you're a buyer, you, you can see it. You need it if you're, if you're re-letting a house. So every home should have one uh, if it's been bought or sold in the last 25 years. Um, and and that will give you some guidance, but it is only guidance because uh, a, a lot of EPCs are delivered quite quickly and, uh, you know, it requires somebody who really understands the house to be able to, to, to suggest the most appropriate things. Control is obviously the one I, I feel most passionate about. Actually, understanding where and how you use your energy is, is a key aspect. And in terms of heat, that means what temperature are you, are you aiming for, where are you doing it, and what times are you doing it. And hopefully, it's in the rooms that you're using when you're using them. But an awful lot of people run heating at weird times when they're not there. And it's not necessary anymore, you know. There's all sorts of nice stuff out there. So there's a bit of a myth. I just want to take time to tackle it. Often you heard about heating is don't turn it off, yeah. leave it running. <laughs> is that true? You shouldn't turn your heating off? Uh, no, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> not a good idea. Um, <laughs> most of us work all day, don't we? You know, so yeah. you, you're in the house until eight o'clock and then you're out until five o'clock. Why on earth would you want to heat your house during those eight hours of, of non-attendance? So, no, that, that, that's, that's not a good thing. And also, you know, there's rooms you might never use, spare bedrooms, you know, bathrooms where you only use them once or twice a day. Well, don't heat them if you don't use them, is, is the honest answer. And these days, you can do that, you know, you can... You can you can have heat zones, as they call them. Um, I, I have a system in my house that, that allows me to, to, to use every room as a distinct and separate entity. So I can have different heat settings, different times for different rooms. And, uh, and that's perfectly possible these days. But even in the, in the most simplest way, if you put thermostatic radiator valves, now a thermostatic radiator valve is like a basic radiator valve, but it has a thermostat on it, so you can set the temperature. Now, one of those is going to cost you about 15 quid. No uh, brainer. To me, yes, yeah. you know. So to set a full set of heating controls, that's a thermostat where you set the, the temperature. It's a timer to tell you when it comes on and when it comes off or a programmer which tells you the days or calendar months that you're going to use your heating. And controls in the system, radiator valves, thermostatic radiator valves. So that's a full set of controls. And if you haven't got a full set of controls, then I would heartily recommend that you do. You could do that whole job if you bought basic equipment for under 200 quid. Which is a fantastic place to start, isn't it? If you're if you're looking to decarbonize at home, uh, and and water. I mean, you could talk about hot water, but mm -hmm. there's other water usage uh, as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I think over time you and I probably talked about rainwater harvesting and yeah. grey water yeah. and uh, and maybe aerated shower heads yeah. and, and hot water tanks. But yeah. you know, which of those are kind of worth investigating? Well, the first thing I, I would say is. Uh, obviously the difference between hot water and, and, and cold water because hot water you are applying energy to make it hot you know and we've got a bizarre situation haven't we you know you, you run if you run a bath you run a hot tap for five minutes and the water's coming out at 60 degrees c and then and then you turn that off and you run a cold tap 
to cool it down so you can get in. So <laughs> when you say it like that, it does sound ridiculous. <laughs> well, of course, but it is ridiculous, you know. So if you have a you know a thermostatic tap, then you could set it at the temperature you need. So I would I would look at hot water devices first if I was looking at water, and the principal hot water device you want to look at is showering. Showering is is the highest water use in any home, and is certainly the highest hot water use. So um, what can you do? You can fit a, a, an aerated shower head, and what that basically does is fills every drop of water fat with air. And when the, when the water hits you, it explodes, which is great because it makes it feel really powerful. But it actually uses 80% less water, <laughs> hot water. Now, hot water makes up a about a third of your heating bill. So it, it's, you know, it's significant, but it's not as big as, as space heating. But well worth, and again, you know, an aerated shower head, which incidentally you can fit. Yeah. Even you, Dan. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I'm willing to believe you. You know, <laughs> you screw the old one out and you screw the new one in and it works, you know. And I, I, I've had one for... 15 years now, and I wouldn't have anything else. Fantastic. So how much would, would an aerated shower head cost? Uh, it depends on the brand, but, you know, you, you could certainly pick one up for, you know, less than £100, that's for certain. Now, that's incredibly useful, uh, Tim, to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Our thanks to Tim Pollard for laying the foundation of what's to come. We'll be hearing from him again later in this series. So in this episode, we've introduced you to some of the easier things that you can do. And we're going to continue that theme in a second episode where we talk about some other cheaper options that are available, like maybe installing a smart thermostat or switching energy tariff. And later in the series, we'll be visiting other homes around the country to talk about all the other technologies that you could consider, from solar PV to solar thermal, from electrical to thermal storage, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, and some exciting new heating technologies. Technologies that could change the way we live for the better. All that's left to say is, if you have been, thanks for watching.